morning encounter. We're going to begin to worship here. You guys are welcome to come in. Um, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. And I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again a clap to the Lord this morning. Jesus, we honor you. We honor you for your amazing love. Man, come on. I'm like ready to skip announcements and just stay in worship with that good throwback. Praise God. All right, guys. Well, good morning. Welcome to Encounter Church. Uh, go ahead and say hi to the folks around you this morning. Get to know them a little bit. Ask them how they're doing.
All right, y'all, you guys can go ahead and grab your seats again. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you all are here. Well, hey, we want to just welcome you this morning. If you're a visitor in the house today, uh, we would love to get to know you more. Uh, we, we're so glad you're here. There's actually a visitor card in the back of one of the seats in front of you. You can pull that out. It has a QR code that leads you to uh, a location where you can see lots of different ways to get connected in a, here at Encounter. We got lots of different groups for all different kinds of folks, youth, kids, men, women, all different ways to connect. So you can check that out. We also have a welcome center that's just outside in the lobby over here uh, where our welcome team would love to get to know you, answer any questions that you have. And they also have a free gift for you. So make sure you don't miss out on that as you leave this morning. Um, Well, we have been starting into a new series that we've been planning for a while called You Asked For It. Uh, And we're, it's just, we've gotten so much great feedback already. Uh, And we've been, we are diving deep into scripture in this sermon series. Next week, actually, Josiah and Michaela are going to be sharing on how to dive into your own personal Bible reading deeper, how to interpret scripture, which is going to be amazing. If you don't know the sleigh balls, you're going to get to know them uh, next week. Um, and, uh, and we thought this would be an awesome time to remind you that we actually have a Bible reading plan that we offer here as a church that we call Encountering the Word. And so it's a plan where we read through five chapters in the New Testament every week and five chapters in the Old Testament every week, which is great because you can read for five days of the week and you get like two cheat days, right? If you get real busy and you miss a day, it's not a big deal. You have five, just five chapters of, in each, each day. So, and you can find it on our website, on our church app, and also in our weekly church emails. It's basically everywhere. You can't really miss it. Um, and we actually are just starting in the New Testament, the books of First and Second Thessalonians, which you're going to want to be familiar with when we do our message on the end times. So it's going to be helpful for you if you join us and read in on that. Um, speaking of being correct in our interpretation of Scripture— Last week, after I shared my message, I was doing some research online, and I had shared about three different groups that disagree about correct Orthodox theology of of, uh, the Trinity and of the Son of God being equal with the Father. And I mentioned Seventh-day Adventists in that group. I don't know if you remember that. I was doing some research this week, and Seventh-day Adventists actually do believe in an orthodox view of the Trinity, meaning a correct view of the Trinity. They do believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equal. They're not heretical in that area. And so I just felt like the need to correct that, you know, because I don't want you guys to have a wrong view of folks who are, you know, have different beliefs. They do have some weird beliefs when it comes to a certain prophet that was prophesying in the 1840s and 50s and some other things about the Old Testament laws that I don't think are biblically correct. But just, we want to be correct here. We want to teach you guys the right way. So, all right, well, we... um also have an awesome video from two of our missionaries who are serving at YWAM Montana, uh, Grace and Benjamin Breon. So can we go ahead and show that hey video? Hey guys. We are coming at you oh, hold from on. the Can YWAM we start her over? Hey guys. Oh, there we go. We are coming at you from the YWAM Liberty ship uh, here in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, it's been two weeks that we've been here and it's pretty awesome. We're the first YWAM Montana missionary team that they sent here and we got to spend time working on renovating three rooms from the ground up and they look awesome now, so. Yeah, yeah we're super excited. Wild Montana, uh, like we said in our last update, uh, we're partnering with Wild Ships Kona and this ship, the Liberty, to translate the Bible for 33 languages in the next three years. So we're super excited about that initiative. Uh, me personally, this has been like a dream of mine ever since I was a little girl about doing missions and getting to translate the Bible. Mm-hmm. So we are stoked to be a part of it. Yeah, I think it's really been a blessing to be able to be a part of a team that's just staff and I've learned a lot about working with people outside of our department and just getting to know them more, um, all the eight of us in this crew. Um, something that we're going to be doing this upcoming fall is I'll be working in the admissions office and in the kitchen and Grace will be doing... I will be in the 33 and 3 team, so the Papua New Guinea team and then also working in creative media. Yeah. And some exciting news is we are the school leaders for EDTS 2024. So we are getting to do that this coming summer, but we're gonna be preparing for that this fall as well. Um, Along with that, this, in just a few weeks, I'll be heading to South Asia to go meet with our team that is out there from this school that we just finished the lecture phase and I'll be doing a pastoral visit to meet with them and help them out, do any kind of care that they might need, so. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your prayers, for your support. 
um, for getting to support us and send us to places like Papua New Guinea. We are so grateful yeah. that this is what we get to do. Um, also very grateful to be a part of Youth with a Mission, a part of YWAM. I don't know if you've heard or not, but Lauren Cunningham passed away yeah. on October 6th. He graduated to heaven and we are just so grateful for his legacy and for him being mm -hmm. obedient to God to start this organization, organization that we get to be a part of it. Yeah, he's the reason why we're even here in Papua New Guinea getting to do Bible translation, help out with that stuff. So, But thank yeah. you guys for all your support and we look forward to this fall. Yeah. All right, come on, that's awesome. I love how you can hear the ocean. They're literally on a ship translating the Bible in Papua New Guinea. How cool is that? Well, can we just, they actually specifically requested that we would pray for them uh, because they're gonna be traveling all around Southeast Asia these next couple weeks. So could you just bow your head, grab your hand of, of somebody next to you? We're just gonna pray for, for Grace and Ben. Lord, we just pray uh, for Grace and Ben over this, uh, these next couple of weeks as they're traveling. Lord, that you would give them your traveling mercies, that you would protect them. God, that you would arrange their timings and their flights. God, that as, as Ben goes and ministers to this team that's serving in Southeast Asia, God, that you would put your grace on him to refresh their spirits, to, 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 that they would be filled uh, with the gift from the Holy Spirit when he comes to them in Jesus' name. So yeah, Lord, we thank you for them and, and for what they're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, you guys can go ahead and stand. We are going to go into our time of worship for this morning. If you'd like to give this morning, you can give in any of the baskets that are found around the sanctuary. And you can also give online uh, by setting up a recurring gift, or you can give one time as well if you'd like to do that through our app or through our website. But we just spent uh, the last two nights you know, here with our friends from Wesley, just seeking this, the presence of the Lord. And I just feel the presence of the Lord is here in this place this morning. I feel that the atmosphere is thin, that heaven is close. And I just feel that the Lord just really wants uh, to meet us in intimacy this morning. So Lord, we invite you in our time of worship. Jesus, there's nothing that we want more than your presence this morning. Lord, we just turn our eyes to you right now. We invite you, Lord. We just say, have your way, Jesus. Come on, can you just say that out loud, Lord? Have your way. Lord, we invite you to have your way this morning. We give you our hearts, God. We surrender to you. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to take us in to the revelation of the Father, to the revelation of Jesus this morning. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Come on, let's worship. It was a moment when the lights went out When death claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned Final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn The sacrifice was made as the heavens roll, sing us out him. Oh, oh, hail King Jesus. Oh, hail the Lord of heaven and earth. And oh,
breaking through When all is lost, he crossed eternity The King of life is on the move In a dark and cold and tomb Where our Lord Oh 
Amen, amen. Let's just give a cop of praise to him this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We just worship you this morning, Lord. May you be magnified, Lord. thousand generations are falling down in worship to sing a song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing a song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, and all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your
satisfy me with your love, with your love, Lord. Now I found my fulfillment, finding my strength.
I mentioned a few weeks ago how everything is a battle for our worship. It's really true. And uh, I want to ask you before you're seated just to take the hand of somebody next to you before I begin the message. I want us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm sure as you've followed in the news, you're aware of what's taking place there. This is Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we honor your word. We honor, Father God, Lord, this directive. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father God, the physical Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, Father God, we realize that 
The enemy hates the fact that there's a Jewish homeland. The enemy hates the fact that there's a restoration that's taking place, Father God, and the, the end time church is a part of, Father God, Jew and Gentile. And Father God, right now we pray for the peace of those who live there. I pray for the, uh, the families that have lost loved ones. I pray for those who are being held hostage. God, I pray, Father God, for the Israeli Defense Forces as they uh, are involved in that conflict. God, I pray for the women and children and innocents in Gaza as well. God, let your hand of protection come upon that part of the world, Father, in Jesus' name. And God, what the enemy intends for evil, I pray that you would redeem for good. God, that revival would come out of this, Father God, that Israelis would look to cry out for Messiah and would find Jesus. That Palestinians that are caught in the middle of a conflict, Father God, would also cry out to God and Father Jesus be revealed to them, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. And everybody said, Amen. And I want to encourage you, if you go on CBN, Christian Broadcasting News website, and look up Jerusalem Dateline, they have very, very well done biblically, uh, from a biblical perspective, reports of the even prayer meetings last week after the, the first week. I engaged in about a 40-minute prayer meeting that they led on that channel for that part of the world. We can't forget that. It's very key what's going on. So uh, my notebook's upside down. How about that? I want to say thank you to everybody that participated in Crossover this past weekend. That was a great time. I know some of you couldn't be there, but it was good. Yeah, give the Lord a hand for what he's doing. It takes an area-wide church to reach an area with revival, and God is doing that. Amen? Uh, so we want to continue to pray for revival. Uh, the title of this message, and you know, we've, we've begun our series on uh, you asked for it, so you asked for it. You can, you can turn to the person next to you and say, you asked for it, right? And uh, I want to say thank you to Jake for doing a great job. I want to thank all of you for your well-thought-out questions that you've given. Some of these are amazing. And I, I mentioned in the prayer room, I would have never worked or built a sermon specifically on this without this series and your questions. Last week, Jake did a great job on the question, where in the Bible does it say Jesus is God? So if you have ever you know, thought about that, wondered about that, wrestled with that, listen to that message. Extremely well done. This morning, what I want to focus in on is what does the Bible say in regards to women's role in the church? We've all thought about that. Is it okay for a woman to teach from the pulpit? Well, this is a, this is a plastic lectern, but it's also a pulpit. Is it okay for a woman to be up here? What do the scriptures say about forbidding women to speak in church? That's one we'll, and we'll, we'll get to all of this. And so these are all honest, honest and legitimate questions, and I will do my best to delve into them. But, I, but I, you know what the Lord really brought to me, the Holy Spirit brought to me? This isn't is in about us defending something as so much as it is we're giving honor to women. Ladies, we want to honor you this morning. We want to honor God's gift in your life and who you are and what you bring to us. So, um, but as I will do my very best to answer these questions. And uh, so this morning we honor and value women. I want to begin in Acts chapter 2. And this is the day of Pentecost. And so the Holy Spirit's outpouring takes place, and this is really, this is the beginning of the New Testament church. This is when the New Testament church is launched and, and starts, and so this is very, very key, and Peter is reading from the book of Joel, and he says in Acts 2, 17, and it shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind, some say all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days forth forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Somebody say, they. 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 I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be, and here's the real key, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So again, this is so foundational, and this is the very launch and beginning of the New Testament church, you know, and if you remember from last week, uh, Jake sharing out of Genesis, in the beginning, God, right? So God created, God is the author, he is the one, and can you believe how confused and disoriented our world and culture are on the issues of gender and sexuality? There's even a documentary titled, What is a Woman?, 
And so the guy who uh, is interviewing people, he goes to people here and there, and he goes, can you tell me what is a woman? And they, and they don't even know. So we're in a very confused and uh, just messed up time in trying to just basically define these very, uh, these very basic roles. So it's, it, the, the deception, it's stunning to say the least. So as the church in the body of Christ, for goodness sakes, let's please be a voice of reconciliation and truth and reason to a world that is living in such confusion. Amen? I think that's what God wants us to be. So in Genesis 1.26... It says, then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, notice the plurality here. Here's another reference to that Father, Son, Holy Spirit that Jake did a great job of explaining last week. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so just a couple things I want to point to here initially is number one, it takes both the man and the woman to fully and adequately represent and reveal the image of God adequately. Amen? Amen. Okay? It it takes both the man and the woman. Uh, Man alone couldn't do it. Woman alone couldn't do it. Both are absolutely needed and necessary. And then secondly, something I want to point out that sometimes we miss is in this commissioning given by God, he says, subdue the earth and rule over it. That was given to both the man and the woman. It says he gave them dominion. Okay? And sometimes I think we miss this piece. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there, there's no order, because in the scripture, I believe there is order, all right? We serve a God of order, and so we're going we're gonna to get to that eventually. We'll, we'll get there, okay? But, uh, and it talks about in the scripture, and we'll touch on these, man was taken from God, or man is the, the reflection of the glory of God, and woman was taken from man, okay? We'll get there. But for the time being, please realize that God made the man and the woman different. Can you say that word, please? Different. Now, isn't it amazing that our, our society is so confused they don't even acknowledge that? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's no difference. No, there is. God made us difference. And the, that difference was created by God so that as men and women, we could complete one another. Okay? Not compete with one another, but that we could complete one another. And together, the man and the woman are an accurate reflection of the image and the fullness of God and what he intends. Can we say amen? Amen. So God never intended for there to be a striving and a a competing that happens, you know. And um, so can we as the church please model for the world what God intended for the complementary roles of the genders as God designed them? Can we model that for the world? I really hope that we can. And you know, we we hear this at wedding after wedding where Ephesians 5.25, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church who sacrificed and laid down for women, respect and honor your husbands. So there is an order there, okay? There is an order that God has has, uh, described and built. And I think that as the church, we haven't always gotten it right. And just another sort of a contextual thought on this. No other faith in the world, in history, no other individual has honored and elevated women like Jesus Christ. That's, that's, I'm sorry, that's just a fact. And, uh, you know, occasionally the church has ignored and fallen short in that of honoring and elevating women, and hopefully we can get it right as, as a part of the body of Christ. Uh, who was the first person Jesus revealed himself to in his resurrected form? Very first one that saw him. Who was it? Mary Magdalene, right? Who was the first person that Jesus publicly revealed himself to as the Jewish Messiah? I who speak to you am he. John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman at the well, okay? Um, How many many love The Chosen? Seen The Chosen? Fantastic. I can't wait for the next episode, four season to come out. 
But in The Chosen, I think the, the portrayal of the woman with the issue of blood has been done so well. And the one thing they really delve into was she was, according to the law, ceremonially unclean because of her issue of blood. But where they, I think they, they sort of delve into the backstory is the rejection, the ostracization from her family, everyone that knew her. And so then in that portrayal, when she presses through the crowd, as the Gospels describe, and touches him, and Jesus sensed that power went from him, and he says, who touched me? Who touched me? And then when he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. How honoring is that? Amen? How about even the woman caught in adultery? where they bring dragging her in, and the, the law says we should stone such a one. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. Do you see the value that he bestowed upon her? And I'm sure she had never experienced that. So please don't miss the value and the worth and the identity and the preciousness that Jesus Christ conveyed upon women like no other faith in the world before since. Uh, even consider the respect and the honor Jesus bestows on his mother Mary while he's dying on the cross. And this is John 19, 26. Jesus, therefore, when he saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household, honoring and providing for her even when he was dying. Is that powerful or what? No one honored and valued women like Jesus. And if you're familiar with uh, you know, the Middle Eastern culture right now where the war is being fought, you know, much of the Islamic culture, even Asian cultures, women are devalued and, and to the point of property, chattel, and are given no dignity at all. So it is so striking, it is so stunning, the value and the worth and the preciousness and the, the elevation that Jesus Christ gave to women, and it's found throughout the, the Bible. So what is the role of women biblically? Well, I'm glad you asked. And, uh, you know, we've already pointed out in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, among the 120 in the upper room, women were equally a part of that group. And we read from the prophet Joel, as Peter read, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Amen. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. Here is, here is the, the sticking verse that uh, sometimes we, get, we sort of seize upon. It says, Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but let them subject themselves, just as the law also says, but if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Now in this, this passage... Everyone points to as the role of women in the church. This is the big kahuna, okay? There it is, finished. And, but as with everything in Scripture, we have to look at the context. Context matters, right? Can you say that, please? Context matters. It matters a lot. So let's look, let's look at what's around this, okay? What's around it? Well, a few verses right before it. Let's look at verse uh, 31. He says, For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, and in all the churches of the saints. How many of you think there may have been some confusion in the Corinthian church? Okay, because immediately after this, then comes verse 34 and 5, let the women keep sign on the churches. They're not permitted to speak. Then he continues on. What comes after that? Let's look at verse 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Then he says, therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but let all things be done properly and in an orderly manner. Do you think everything was being done in an orderly manner in the Corinthian church? Well, First of all, does this apply to every church for all time? Of course it does. Of course it does. But again, context matters. The Corinthian church is without question 
the most dysfunctional, chaotic, disorderly, and if I can say sin-filled and sinful church in the New Testament. This was, this was the messed up church in the New Testament. And so uh, there was actually an earlier letter written where Paul, the Apostle Paul rebukes them. It's called the sorry letter, and they lost it. Now, would it made it into the, into the uh, canon or not? I don't know. But they lost, the, they lost an epistle, okay? And the Greek city of Corinth, there was a temple to Af it's Aphrodite, a Greek god, where a thousand temple prostitutes served. Now, as a young man at 22 years of age, I went on a biblical tour, and we ended up in Greece, and I was in Corinth. And I was looking on the wall, and here was a depiction, here was a vase, and it had a depiction of what went on in that temple. And I went, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? The very word to Corinthianize meant and means to debase oneself in the most vile sexual degradation possible to Corinthianize, okay? And this, this spirit of immorality had found its way into the Corinthian church. And let me read from chapter 5. Here's 1 Corinthians 5. He says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife, and you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead in order that the one who had done this deed might be removed from your midst. For I on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. And then in verse 5 he says, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So this is the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a messed up church. It was a chaotic church. And then continuing in verse 6, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump just as you were in fact unleavened for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Now the point I'm making is this. This was an incredibly dysfunctional and messed up church. And as much as the Apostle Paul was speaking in regards to women, he's speaking in regards to order. Most of the churches, in fact, pretty much all of the churches in the New Testament were house churches. They met in homes. They were small. And so uh, Paul's admonition, again, to, to women not to speak in this setting was to bring order to an utterly chaotic situation. The person who tries to apply that universally across all of Christendom to every assembly in every church saying, women keep silent in the church is ignoring an entire body of evidence and testimony and history of what went on in the early church, both New Testament and Old Testament. We'll delve into that some, okay? Again, most of the churches in the New Testament were house churches. Acts 2.42, they met in the temple and house to house. Philemon's 1, it says, To Philemon, our beloved brother, fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, to our Chippus, our fellow soldier, to the church in your house. That's how most of them met. And then in 2 John 1, he addresses, this is John writing, and he says, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also who know the truth for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Now, this church was hosted by this woman, the chosen lady, in her house. Now, wouldn't it have been a little awkward if she wasn't permitted to speak? Okay, you could go there, but anyway. Let's read in, uh, this is Acts 21, verse 8. It says, on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea. Now this is Paul on his journey towards Rome. Entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Now do you remember our verse from Acts 2.17? What did it say? Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Now if they were not permitted to speak, how would they have prophesied? It'd be a little awkward, wouldn't it? Okay, um, 
Women being anointed and used by God prophetically is found in both the New and the Old Testament. When King Josiah, who is the, the last godly king of the southern kingdom of Judah, they're remodeling the temple and they find the book of the law which they had lost. Can you believe they had lost the scriptures under King Manasseh and the, the terrible history prior to him? And when they find it, he begins, they begin reading it and he says, he says uh, and it says when he, when he reads the, the book of the law, he rends his clothes. The king is so grieved because he says, great is the wrath of God towards us who have not heeded the words of this book. And then they go, they, they send for the word of the Lord. Well, guess who the word of the Lord is in? Huldah, a woman prophet. And this is described in 2 Kings 22. He says, go inquire of the Lord for me and the people of all Judah concerning the words of this book which has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Akbor and Shaphan and Asa, all these guys go. This, this is the king's counselors. They went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harus, keeper of the wardrobe. Now, she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her. Now, the reason why these other names are mentioned was she wasn't just a nobody. Whenever it lists the, the, the son or the daughter of this one and this one and this one, it means they were somebody. Okay, she is a woman of note. Now, she gives the word of the Lord, which basically confirms that judgment is coming. She does affirm King Josiah, says, because your heart was tender, this, this will not come upon you, but it will come after you. All right? So she actually confirms that judgment, but God speaks to the nation through this woman. Let me all say, th say this too. Throughout the word of God, women anointed by God's spirit have shown incredible courage and leadership in dire circumstances throughout the scripture. How about Queen Esther? Do you realize Queen Esther was probably about 19 years old? And she finds herself the queen of the most powerful monarch on the face of the earth at that time, Xerxes, and when the plot by Haman is hatched to destroy all the Jews, and uh, Mordecai sends word to her and says, who knows for such a time as this, have you been elevated to the palace? And do you remember what her words are? I will go into the king in what is in not in accordance to the law. And if I perish, I perish. What if she had kept silent? Do you realize, you know, we saw the testimony of Ben and Grace on the screen. Do you realize there are more missionaries in the world that are women than men? There was one at last night's service, and Rich couldn't even say where she serves. He says she serves in a difficult part of the world. One of their co-workers was recently martyred and killed in that part of the world. What if those women kept silent? Thousands, if not millions, would not hear the good news of the gospel. Does God anoint and work through women? Absolutely he does. Queen Esther, how about Ruth, a young Moabitess? She leaves everything from the land of Moab, comes back with her mother-in-law, says, says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I lodge. Your God will be my God, your people, my people, and neither shall anything but death separate from you. She, a Moabitess, becomes a part of the lineage of Messiah because of her dedication and faithfulness to her mother-in-law. And again, Ruth, the book of Ruth is a beautiful, beautiful poetic book. How about, I just read this this year in my own reading. Uh, Abigail. Remember when Abigail, David goes, sends his servants to Nabal's men and says, can you, we've kept watch over your, your sheep and your herds. Will you, and Nabal goes, who is David? Who's the son of David? And David is putting on his armor and going to go down and wipe out the whole clan. And Abigail, a godly, anointed, gifted woman, speaks to the servants, puts supplies on donkeys and skins of raisins and wine, meets David and then says, says my Lord, let, let the wrath of God be on me and my house. And then he says, blessed are you who have prevented me from taking out my own wrath and vengeance upon the house of Nabal. A godly, wise, gifted woman. And then my favorite in all the scripture, and Brent was... <laughs> sharing so much about this in the prayer room, I appreciate this, is Deborah. And Deborah is a judge of Israel. She's anointed, she is raised up by God. This is in Judges chapter four and five to lead the entire nation. 
And they have been under 20 years of a hellish oppression by King Jabin, a Canaanite king. And something that I particularly love about her example is through it all, she never loses or compromises her femininity. She says, until I arose a mother in Israel. Let's, let's look into this. Here's what I mean by that. Anointed by God, she leads with courage and boldness, yet she does it as a gifted woman. She doesn't become a man. She leads as a gifted woman. How many remember uh, Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel? How about Maggie Thatcher, the Iron Lady? Do you know what she did? She saved Great Britain from socialism in the late 70s. Okay. What are we struggling against in, that, in, in our country right now? Uh, Nikki Haley, I wonder. Uh, you can just chuckle to that to yourself. The Iron Lady. But okay, here's... All right, here's Judges 4. Here's about Deborah. Back to Deborah. Now, Deborah, a prophetess. Can you say that word, please? A prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. The sons of Israel came to her for judgment. She is leading the entire nation. Now, she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give them into your hand. Notice who's giving the word of the Lord here. Deborah, a godly anointed woman. Then Barak said to her, verse 8, if you go with me, I will go. If you do not go with me, I will not go. He says, unless you go with me, I am not going anywhere. And then again, she responds in a, in a very godly, can I say feminine way, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey you are about to take, for the Lord will sell Caesarea into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh, Barak called Zebulun and Nathali together to Kadesh. 10,000 men went up with him. Deborah also went up with him. They go to Mount Tabor. I've been in that valley, Megiddo. Jabin comes out. Sisera comes out with 900 chariots of iron. Now, that's like 900 tanks, all right? That was the tank in, the, in that day. 900 chariots of, of iron. God sends a torrent of rain. The valley becomes a bog of mud. And the chariots all bogged down in the mud. And Sisera, this man of war, he, they're, they're routed before these Israelis who are on foot. And so he alights from his chariot, he runs, and he takes shelter in the tent of Jael the Kenite, another woman. Now, I'll tell you what. They say don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Jael. So he goes in, he, and says they were at peace with the Kenites at that time. So she gives him a bowl of milk, a bowl of curds. She covers him with a cloak. He lays down. He goes to sleep. And she comes and drives a tent peg through his, stake, through his temple, killing him. Don't mess with <laughs> certain women. Donna would never do that. <laughs> She's probably felt like it a time or two. But she's never done it. Oh, my goodness. So when we celebrate and commemorate deliverance and prophetic words and victory and prophecies, do you see how much women are a part of this biblical story and history? And, and let me say this. For the person that says, women keep silent in the church, sit down, shut up. They, you can hold that conviction if you want to, okay? I, but you... To do so, you have to ignore an entire biblical record of history and breakthrough and events. You, you can ignore all that if you choose to, okay? But you do. You have to really ignore a lot to, to stay there and apply that to all Christendom everywhere. Judges chapter 5. This is one of my favorite passages in all of the scripture. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Ahinoam, sang on that day. They are prophesying saying, when the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. 
Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers. I to the Lord, I will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when thou didst go out from Seir, when thou didst march from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens dripped, the clouds dripped with water, the mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. Do you know what's taking place there? Romans 8, it says, all earth, all the earth shakes and anticipates for the revealing of the sons of God. That's what was happening. The sons and daughters of God were coming forth. And it says, all the earth, the mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. This Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, there she is, the highways were deserted. The travelers went by roundabout ways. Until peasantry ceased, they ceased in Israel. Until I, Deborah, arose, I arose, a, say it with me, mother in Israel. She didn't lead as a man. She lived as a woman. When I was a student at Christ for the Nations, about 20, 21 years old, a woman came from South or Central America, probably in her mid-30s, and she was absolutely completely feminine, but very confident. She had been used of God to raise up something like 18 churches across that nation. Now, you know what? You know what mantle she wore? Deborah anointing. The Deborah mantle is an apostolic mantle, okay? Can women sometimes bear that mantle? Absolutely, okay? Um, <laughs> now, one more, one more kind of example I want to delve into, and then I'll land this ship, okay? God is a God of order, as we've said. Uh, God is also one who has established certain scriptural biblical patterns, okay? He's also a God of patterns. Let me explain this. When we talk about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit's outpouring, now I know on the day of Pentecost it came like a mighty rushing wind. However, throughout the book of Acts, the biblical pattern for the baptism in the Holy Spirit was through the laying on of hands. Okay, that was the biblical pattern. Um, here from Acts 8.18, here's the pattern being described. Now when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands... He offered them money. Okay, now, through, so the laying on of hands is the New Testament pattern for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many would agree, though, God occasionally chooses to work outside of his own pattern? All right? And when Peter has three dreams and a vision to finally get him to the house of Cornelius, and this is in Acts chapter 10, and so He's, he's there, and he's preaching the message, and this is described in Acts 10, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, now he, he comes into the house, Cornelius falls down to worship him. He's a pagan Roman, doesn't know God at all. Okay, now he prayed and gave alms, but he falls down to worship. Peter says, stand up, I too am just a man. Then all the people gathered, he begins giving this message to them. They're hearing the gospel and here it is in verse 44, Acts 10. While Peter is still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised or Jewish believers who were with Peter, who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Now, there's a reason for this, okay? Peter is a Jew. Cornelius is a Gentile pagan. As far as Peter's concerned, I don't belong here. In fact, when he got back to Jerusalem, they took issue with him. They said, you went to Gentiles and ate with them. Then he says, hey, who was I to resist God? He shares the vision that he had. He ends up there, and Peter is going to deliver the goods and get out of Dodge as fast as he can. And God says, okay, Peter, you're not going to give an altar call? I'll, give, I'll do it for you. <laughs> and so the Holy Spirit, now, the pattern, the New Testament biblical pattern for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what? Through the laying on of hands. Does God choose to work outside of his own pattern? Yes, he does. Another New Testament biblical pattern, okay, is water baptism. Water baptism, the biblical pattern for water baptism is immersion. The, the Greek word for baptize, baptizo, means to dip or immerse, okay, full-on immersion. 
How many Anabaptists do we have here in the room? Were you sprinkled? Does God honor sprinkling? Why did they begin to sprinkle? Well, for one, if you got baptized publicly in the water, they killed you, okay, and back in Switzerland, and this is all going on. And also, you could go out and break the ice and dump them in and let them freeze under there and then pull them out later in the spring, okay? So while the New Testament pattern, biblical pattern for water baptism is emerzo to dip, does God honor? Baptism is by faith. When we're sprinkled, is that legitimate baptism? Some say it's not. Yes, it is. Does God choose to sovereignly step outside of his pattern? On occasion, yes, he does. So I'll say this. God has established a pattern both in the home and in the church. All right? And I want to, I want to begin here. Men and women are absolutely equal in value, redemptively, and in every single way. They're absolutely equal. Galatians 3.23, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, I'm talking about value, okay? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ. Now, that is speaking redemptively at the foot of the cross. That's not talking about our roles. We're equal in value, but guess what? We've got different job descriptions, all right? So we're absolutely equal in value redemptively, but that being said, our job descriptions differ. They're unique. They complete one another. They complement one another. They don't compete with one another, okay? Now, let me just say this, and I'm not saying an absolute, but men are more wired... For leadership, influence, provision, protection, etc. Okay, they're more wired that way. Women tend to be more wired by God for compassion, nurture, empathy, being more in tune with the heart and the emotions. It's been said this way the husband is the head of the home, the wife is the heart of the home. Now, let me, let me just, that is especially true for Donna and me. I've got the goals and I've got the plans and I lean on my intellect and intellect and she has so often, when our kids were still at home and small, she would say to me, we need to enjoy the children now. She would keep me rooted and grounded in the now and in the emotion and in the valuing and in the nurturing that I, I would run right past it. Because again, it's not good or bad, it's just we're different. Now, I realize in some marriages that's, that, that can be a little bit reversed. I'm not, going, I'm not worried about that. But, you know, while I'm thinking about my five-year plan and my 10-year plan, she is saying we need to, to spend our time now. It's with our grandchildren. My goodness, did I need to hear that. So while I had destination disease, she kept me rooted in the present. Now, that in a general sense is how men and women are wired. I think by God, we approach things differently. It's neither good or bad. It's different, all right? Say that word, different. It is different. Now, with that perspective, I want us to look at another scriptural passage which often pops up in this discussion, all right? And I believe it points to this uniqueness of how we're wired in this particular passage. Now, this is 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 through 15. He says, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as befits a woman claiming to godliness. Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now, verse 12, here's the big one again. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being quite deceived fell into transgression. But women shall be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love, sanctity, and self-restraint. Now, the real sticky wicket in this passage centers around verse 12. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Okay, now... What does that mean? I believe the real key here is found in, in those two words, exercise authority. If you look those up in the Greek, all right, New Testament written in Greek, the word is authenteo. And the Greek word authenteo means one who acts on his own authority. That word occurs there in the New Testament only one time, and this is it. This is the only place 
This is found in the New Testament. Why is that important? In the Gospels, Jesus exhorts the disciples. This is Matthew 20, 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and the great men exercise authority over them. Now here a different word is used than in 1 Timothy. The word used here, it's longer, katexousiosso, help me Jake, anyway. <laughs> now that word, katexousioaxio, means to exercise authority. The word from Timothy is a far stronger word. It means to exercise one's own authority. And I believe that lends itself to the accurate translation to usurp authority. And you know what the, the word usurp means? Usurp means for me to take or seize forcibly a 30 authority that doesn't belong to me. It's what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine right now, okay? That's usurping authority. And you can accurately, I believe, this is my conviction, translate this verse, I do not allow a woman to teach or usurp authority. And you can also, it leans toward, toward over her man. There's a lot pointing to that being an, the, the husband. Now remember when I said we're wired differently? And that's what I believe he's referring to here when he says, he says, for the, for the woman was not, the man was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. We'll get there in a moment. I'm not, I'm not ready to go there yet, okay? I believe this, where he says, I do not allow a woman to teach or usurp authority over her man, but remain quiet. I believe that God places greater accountability on men to lead, to envision, to provide. you know what the word provision means? Provision means pro and vision. To look ahead, to see the danger, to spot the things that are coming down the road that are a threat, and to make provision to protect the family, okay? I believe men are more accountable in this role than women are. And I will say this, this verse is not to keep women down. It is to call men higher. Oftentimes in homes, a husband will say, oh, she prays with the children. I let her read the Bible to the kids. She takes them to church. And let me just say this. In a home where the, the husband or the man shirks his responsibility to engage spiritually in the family with the children, in that home, 15% of those children will follow in the faith. If you flip it and the husband engages in the faith, prays with the kids, reads to the kids, makes sure they're in church, it totally reverses 85% follow in the faith. You can say wow, okay? That's, that's a real wow. This verse is not shoving women down. It is calling men up. And I realize, you know, sometimes the temptation here is at times for a woman to wrestle with her husband over this role. Now, uh, I married a very good girl. She has never wrestled with me in this role. Now, she's, she's had the JL moment a time or two. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> in this passage... The Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit are providing a distinction. And then he says, For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being quite deceived fell into transgression. And do you remember in Genesis 3? It says when she saw the fruit was good, and she saw it was the delight to the eyes, and would make one wise. What does that sound like? It's a little more, the enemy is playing the heartstrings. Do you see the heartstrings? Where was Adam? He was standing right there watching. And the big dope didn't say a thing. Okay? So I believe this is pointing to that distinction of a woman being more in tune with the nurturing side, the compassionate side. Do you know women score higher? I'm not into labels. Are there women apostles and pastors? You decide. But let me say this. Women score higher in the shepherding role. Do you know why? They're more nurturing. They care more. They empathize more easily. That's how God built us. Now this order, I believe, that is being sort of pointed out here is described in, this is 1 Corinthians 11. It says, for a man ought not to have his head covered since he, man, is the image of the glory of God, 
but woman is the glory of man. There's an order here, okay? The, the value is the same, but the job descriptions are different. Are we all right with that? Then in verse 12, he sums it up. He says, for as the woman originates from the man, so the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate with God. He is in no way disparaging or devaluing women. He is referencing the biblical pattern and order of God's creation. Okay? Is this making sense? I hope it is. And verses 13 and 14. It was Adam who was first created, then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was quite deceived fell into transgression. And at the beginning of this message, I said, as the husband is the head of the home, the wife is the heart of the home, I believe this is pointing to that difference of how we complete one another. And again, this is not putting women down. It's calling men up. Do you know what? God always calls us higher. Aren't you glad? He, also, he always calls us higher. So we're wired differently by God. All right? The man is often more led by his intellect. The woman can be led more by the heart and by the emotions. Just recently, I had someone very close to me. They were struggling in an area, and, and I said to them, make sure you're not led by your emotions. Make sure you're being led by the will of God. Emotions are a powerful thing, right? We all need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Can we say amen to that? We all need to be led not by our flesh, not by our feelings, not by our emotions, by the Holy Spirit. So, I had one, what time is it? I got a little time. Here's where the emotional side and the rational side of a woman becomes a strength, all right? Scientists claim that a woman has 20 more thousand connections between the left hemisphere and right hemisphere of the brain. What that means is the emotional side talks to the intellectual side. Women's intuition, right? That's also why a woman has greater capacity for words, 20,000 words in a day, where a man it's about eight, right? Women were the best code breakers in the Second World War because working with words and stuff, they could see the patterns, okay? So because the emotional side talks to the rational side, a woman can smell a rat quicker. Donna smells a rat a lot quicker than I do. She'll say, there's just something about that guy I don't trust. And I have learned to trust her intuition. She's right, okay? Now, men, they say that, that the brain hemispheres separate and the emotional side doesn't talk to the intellectual side. That's why we're all half-wits, all right? <laughs> and all the ladies said, amen. But again, we're more directed by our intellect and our thought processes than by our emotions. That can be both a good thing and a bad thing. Men, God tasks you, holds you accountable for, puts a greater responsibility on you for leadership and provision for your home, foresight. In instances where a woman begins to wrestle for that control or headship in the home, you often end up with a real mess. And I've seen it. Now that sounds very chauvinistic. Um, anyway. This is a very, um, in, in just about a month, let me, let me just say this. So, can... A woman speak or teach or prophesy in the church. Your sons and daughters, what? Shall prophesy. I think the answer is yes. All right? Yes. Yes, she can. Yet she, like all of us, myself included, need to be properly related to spiritual authority and covering. Okay? We have an elder team here. I'm accountable to them. We have an oversight team, HarvestNet. In just about a month, Lisa Hostler will come, who leads the Line Life Ministries with excellence, and she will bring the morning message. Now, when she is here, she is fully submitted to our oversight authority of our elder team and myself, and even HarvestNet, okay? So, yes, she has valuable things to say, and she is rightly submitted to biblical authority. Does that make sense? I hope this is landing well. This is a very broad topic, maybe for more than one message. And I want to I just say, if, if you have any further questions or maybe strugglings or wrestlings, please come see one of the elder team, myself. 
here's what I, that's what I ask you to do. Here's what I ask that you please don't do. If you get stuck on one particular point, here and online, don't take the social media and start a terror campaign. Please don't do that. Can I say this? If you do, we're all accountable. Okay? We are. We're all accountable. But I want us to pray, and here's what I'd like to do as we, as we close. I want to invite the worship team. I want to invite and request that you ladies please stand. Could you all please stand? Now, if you're next to your spouse, your, your wife, please lay your hand on her. Somebody else, just extend your hand. Just extend your hand in their direction. We are going to pray blessing over our women. And then I'm going to ask them to pray blessing over us as men to step into the roles that God has for us. So, ladies, we bless you. We honor you. We value you. We acknowledge you for the gift that you are to the body of Christ. We acknowledge you for the anointing that you carry, for the prophetic gifts that are released to you and through you. We acknowledge you and honor you for how God has uniquely gifted you and anointed you. Father, we thank you for the foot being level at the foot of the cross, that redemptively we all have equal value. And Father God, I thank you for gifting us and, and anointing us and, and allowing us, empowering us to speak life and blessing and understanding and godly order to a world that is so broken and dysfunctional and lost and just struggling apart from you, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So God, we honor the ladies among us. We honor them for their, their uniqueness, for their courage, for their for their beauty, for the calling in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. And now, ladies, I would like you just to, to please pray and direct blessing over the men in your life and those just around you. Go ahead. We'll just take a few minutes. Go ahead. Pray. Loud and out loud. We can hear you. Go ahead. my bride to pray blessing over the men. Thank you, honey. She's going to get me later, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, Jesus, I thank you for men. God, I thank you for just how you have wired them, God, and how we need each other. And I just pray for their leadership in the homes, their leadership in their workplaces, God, their leadership um, in their friendships, too, with other men, God, that you would um, use them in a mighty way. Thank you for, um, as women, share with them and, and teach them more how they need to use their emotions to touch um, the lives of people. God, I thank you that, that their wiredness of being, um, uh, using their, their uh, leadership and just leaning on you, God, that they would do that in a mighty way. And I thank you for that. Thank you for um, just how we all complement each other, men and women together. And I just pray that in the church and outside the church, God, that we can be a model for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, honey. You know, even though I'm technically finished, I, I want to say this. Jack Hayford, I heard, give a wonderful explanation of this passage. He said, because women are more able to easily perceive spiritual things sometimes than men are. Again, this verse is inviting ladies, if you'll just take a step back, a half a step back, and allow that man to begin to hear from God. It's true. As, as men, we're not, because women are wired to respond, they respond actually better to the Holy Spirit sometimes than men do. And again, this isn't putting women down. It's saying if you will voluntarily take a step back, and allow that man to take a step forward. Let him hear from God and begin to exercise leadership. And here's another thing he said. Ladies, if you'll duck, God can shoot that rebellious man. Sometimes that's what we need to do too, okay? So let's all stand together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, just the, the, the wonderful model that we have. Through your word, the example, the, the history, the scripture, the Bible, Father, for your Holy Spirit leading and guiding us into all the truth, showing us things to come. We rejoice in you being the God of our salvation. And if there's anybody here on the sound of my voice that's never given you their yes, 
Lord, I thank you for the invitation that the king of the universe laid down his life and died in your place. That through yielding control of your life to him and placing Jesus Christ on the king of the throne of your heart, you can step out of death and into life, out of darkness and into light. In Jesus' name, amen? We're going to sing a closing song as we do. If you would like personal ministry or prayer, please come. Somebody will pray with you, lay hands on you. Prophetic team's over here waiting on God for a word, right? Okay, let's worship. Thank you. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of You
Amen. Amen. Go with the Lord Jesus. Bless others. Speak life. Sons and daughters, prophesy. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for just being awesome, awesome, awesome people and a great family. Thank you. Yeah, give the Lord a hand.